Well, again, good morning and welcome to King's Cross. Uh, my name is Clint, one of the elders of this church. I have the privilege of opening up God's Word to you this morning. Uh, love this church, love gathering with this church, love the chance to open God's Word. And I pray that God has stirred your affections for Himself, for His glory, for His grace and kindness through our study so far of Exodus as he has my own. Uh, again, it's been a hard few weeks. Uh, Tim, Tim's funeral uh, was on Thursday. Uh, several other difficult things going on, uh, but in the midst of it, God has just given me a sweet time of personal worship and so much of that through the study even of Exodus. So I pray that it's been equally uh, as encouraging and helpful uh, to you as well. Now the Lord Jesus, early in his earthly ministry, walked up on some ordinary fishermen And he invited, commanded them, and they made a promise to them. But he said, follow me, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me, that's the command. I command you, come follow me. And then the promise, and I will make you fishers of men. Followers, you see, are fishermen. Those who follow God in Christ are those who try to help other people follow God in Christ. But that leads me to think about just some questions. And even in our study of Moses this morning, what kind of people does God use to accomplish his purposes in the world? What does it look like for him to call people to salvation and then to send them to pagan nations, even pagan rulers, to proclaim the good news of the gospel and advance this salvation? What do you need to be the kind of person that God uses to indeed advance his good purposes in this broken world? And even missions itself, what's the end goal of all missions? What's the end goal of all of our evangelism? What's the end goal of every sermon preached, every lesson taught? What's the end goal of every time we reach out, every time we send someone to the foreign lands to proclaim the gospel or send someone to start a new church? What's the end goal of all mission? How do we measure success? Now, last week, we left off with Moses still in exile in Midian, having a conversation with God as Israel continues to suffer under the ruthless bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt. And God has let Moses know that I'm going to advance, I'm going to save, I'm going to deliver my people, set them free from captivity in Egypt, take them to a new land, this new land of promise. And Moses, you're the deliverer. And he showed and and is showing and revealing to Moses that this is going to be accomplished by God's plan, according to God's provisions, and for God's purposes. And again, just in reminder, in context, Israel's been under tyranny of this wicked rule for more than four centuries, crying out in great suffering. I think sometimes we can feel like suffering for a day is difficult. So my family has traded around and sent around little colds and sicknesses and viruses for the last three or four months. And and Noah's got another cold this morning. So wifey's at home yet again with him. And so we can feel like, man, I'm I'm, I'm getting weary of just being sick, just having a common cold. I want life to be normal. Can you imagine the weariness of suffering under ruthless bondage for 400 years? Moses has been in Midian for 40 years, raising a family, being an ordinary shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro. And then at Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, God confronts him in a burning bush, calls him by name, and starts this conversation with him and says he's going to send Moses to deliver these people. Now, if you remember from last week that Moses responds reluctantly with some questions. Question number one is like, who am I? <laughs> like, wait, 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 I think you got the wrong person. Who am I that you would send me to go do this? And God responds patiently with him and says, you're asking the wrong question. I will be with you. So you're asking, who am I? But but, what you need to be asking is, who is with you in this work? Well, then Moses is like, well, I got a second reluctant question. Who are you? (laughs) Like, what's your name? Like, if when I go to the people, then then what do I tell them? And we saw that God kind of pulls back the curtain. He says, tell them that the great I am sent you. Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of the patriarchs, the fathers, the one who's made these promises to redeem a people. You tell them, I sent you. This is where we pick up our conversation today. And Moses is going to have three more reluctant questions, kind of in argument with God in this calling. Moses, you see, like most of us, is full of excuses, reluctant to do what God has called us to do. There's much we can learn about being fishers of men through God's call on Moses to go and deliver his people from bondage in Egypt. And so there are many observations we'll make about what does it mean to be a spiritual leader, a sent one, one who goes on behalf of God. The main point tying it together, spiritual leaders must go while relying on God's sufficiency to accomplish God's purposes for God's glory. (laughs) So i got to go, but i got to rely on Him because it's His plan and His purposes and all of it is for His glory. And so this is what we see. Church planters, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, parents, 
faithful ambassadors in the workplace and in the public square, to be a follower of Christ is to be a fisher of men, is to be one who goes and represents and speaks on behalf of God and his gospel in whatever capacity he has called you to. So if you want a title this morning, go because I am said so. (laughs) Go because I am said so. Let's pray and ask for God's help and we'll jump in. Father, our great God and Savior, Yahweh, the great I am, the self-existent, self-sufficient God who's revealed himself climactically in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us to see and believe and trust and obey. Even as the old hymn says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Help us be your people. Help us trust and help us obey in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to cover a lot of ground, so there wasn't a lot of Scripture read in the Scripture reading, but we're going to cover what was read and all of chapter 4. So buckle up. Uh, There's going to be a lot of observations about spiritual leadership. I want to give you three exhortations to hang it all on. But just know as we go through, there's probably going to be 15, 18 observations about spiritual leadership. But you can hang them all on these three main exhortations. Spiritual leaders, number one, go take God's Word. Go take God's Word. We'll look at 3, 16 to 22. Spiritual leaders, go take God's Word. Number two, go with God's power. Go with God's power, chapter 4, 1 to 17. And then number three, go for God's glory. Go for God's glory, chapter 4, verse 18 to 31. Let's get after it. Number one, go take God's word. First notice, God tells Moses to take God's word to God's people. We'll look again at verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, that is Yahweh, the great I am. The God of your fathers, the covenant-keeping God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites. I'm always nervous I'm going to say parasites right there. Uh, That's just a freebie uh, for entertainment. You understand when you're reading Scripture publicly, you're nervous. Sister did a good job a minute ago not doing that. But the parasites, not the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and a land flowing to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this should sound uh, familiar to you. Last week in in, in chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, God told Moses this. I'm the God of the patriarchs, and I'm coming to deliver. I've seen, I've heard, I've observed, I know the suffering, I've remembered my covenant, and I'm coming to my people, I'm going to set them free. And even as he unpacked, he continues to remind, I am that faithful covenant-keeping God. I am the God of Israel. I am Yahweh, the great I am. And even as as he recounts this, why would God over and over uh, identify himself and repeat himself in this? He's he's letting Moses know. No, you go to Israel and you tell them the great I am, that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has met with you and promised to deliver them. You go in my name. And immediately, there's just a few simple lessons we can learn about spiritual leadership just from these opening verses. God calls spiritual leaders to hear his word and take his word to his people. (laughs) So he told him in verse 6 through 8, listen, this is, what I'm, this is who I am. This is what I've done in the past. This is what I'm doing right now. This is what I'm going to do in the future. Do you hear my promises? Do you hear my word? Now take that word you just heard to my people. That's what spiritual leaders do. Hear the word of God and take his word to his people. Spiritual leaders bank on God's promises and exhort his followers to do the same. Also, we notice and learn here that God calls spiritual leaders to lead with other spiritual leaders. So he says, go to the elders of Israel. Now, elders in Israel were the leaders of the people of Israel. So in the Old Testament, God had elders in place to lead and shepherd and care for his people. And so he says to Moses, no, 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 go proclaim the word you've heard, but go to the elders, go to the leaders of the people and lead with them. And so we just see spiritual leadership, the best kind of leadership is leadership done with other leaders. Not one man show, not one, uh, kind of a one man star leading the way. No, Moses, you go to the elders of Israel. And even Christ teaches, and the the New Testament teaches in the New Testament church, God has given elders to the church, a plurality of qualified men called to lead and shepherd and care for the flock. This has always been God's plan. Spiritual leadership is a plurality of qualified leaders. But also notice spiritual leaders are fueled by God's past faithfulness. So he keeps repeating this. The reason he keeps repeating it is like, don't forget, I'm faithful. (laughs) So I'm going to send you forward. I'm going to tell you to go take my word to my people. But remember, I've been faithful in the past. I'm faithful in the present. I'll be faithful in the future. So I'm fueling you on your mission with my faithfulness. He gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac in their old age. 
He provided a ram in the bush in the midst of the moment to spare Isaac's life. He spared Joseph's life, and indeed all of Israel, even despite his brother's wickedness, who they, even though they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. He's heard the cries of his people in the wilderness and their suffering, and he has remembered his covenant. And ultimately, he sent his son to live the perfect life we could not live and die the death we all deserve for our sin in order to forgive us of our sins and on the third day raise up from the grave that we may have life and life more abundantly. He's always been faithful in the past. Therefore, you can take his word into the future. But not only is Moses and all spiritual leaders called to take his word to his people, notice they also take it to the nations. So we bring God's word to God's people. That's discipleship. We also bring God's word even to his enemies, even to pagan nations. This is evangelism. So look at verse 18. And they will, speaking of the elders, they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt, that is Pharaoh, and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So now Yahweh tells Moses, you're going to go tell the elders. They're going to listen to you. And then you and the elders are going to go to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the one who's kept all in bondage. And you're going to request to go into the wilderness for a three days journey to worship God, to make sacrifices for sins and to declare your allegiance to this covenant keeping God, Yahweh. Now, this obviously would enrage Pharaoh. Pharaoh saw himself as a god and particularly as their master. So you're going to come to Pharaoh and say, we're going to go worship the god of the Hebrews, the slaves he owns. So you're going to go to him and say, hey, we're not, not only are we not worshiping you, we want to leave you and go worship a different god. And so we're asking you. So again, this moment uh, for Moses, I'm sure, would be, okay, wait a minute, time out. Like, what's, whew, all right. Not only am I going to go to the elders and they need to believe me, but now we're going to go to Pharaoh and ask for freedom to go worship. Now, some in this text, some scholars, some people have, have read it and accused God of being dishonest and asking for a three days journey only, right? Is God's not planned to deliver them to the promised land? So why does God say to Moses, go and ask for three days to worship? Is this God being dishonest? There's uh, no reason to accuse God of dishonesty. There's several different p- potential explanations uh, for why this is not dishonest. Number one, God does not tell Moses to communicate anything about when they will return or what happens after those three days. So let us go three days journey and worship God. He doesn't say, and then we'll come back and continue to be servants. So it might just be that he's made the statement and he hasn't given the rest of the details. That's one possible explanation. There's also, secondly, sufficient evidence in ancient writings that three days journey was was a kind of an idiom that expressed an indefinite indefinite amount of time. So y'all, I'm going to go out on vacation for a few days. And then you're just saying a general term. So three days journey might just be an idiom used to talk about going on a particular journey without a necessarily definitive time. But I think most likely the last one, this is is a wartime bartering technique. So think about what's going to happen as we continue through Exodus. God and Pharaoh are going to go at it. And there's going to be consistent negotiating going on. Do this or I'll do this. Nope. Okay, I'll do that then. Okay, well, okay, do this. Like, so there's going to be this back and forth. So this seems to be the first initiation to say, no, no, two enemies are about to go at it. God is about to demonstrate he is the God who has power even over Pharaoh, and he started up the conversation. The negotiations have begun. At least give us three days to go forth and worship. And God knows he's going to say no, and I'm going to flex my strong hand to show and, and demonstrate this. But this is just the beginning of the battle. I assume that's the case because, again, this language of strong hand of the Lord will be mentioned repeatedly as as overruling Pharaoh. As we go throughout Exodus, you're going to see this strong hand. And even Pharaoh would have, that language would have been particularly uh, offensive. And ancient Egyptian texts uh, read that often described the power of Pharaoh by saying that he had a strong hand or arm to destroy his enemies. So Pharaoh regularly liked this phrase to talk about he had the power. He had the strong hand. He had the strong arm either way Moses and the elders are to go tell Pharaoh they want to worship the God of the Hebrews that's what they're supposed to do God is picking a fight with Pharaoh and God is going to win and he's going to win such a decisive victory that he says when his people go free notice they're not going to go empty-handed so I'm not only going to set you free (laughs) I'm going to set you free full of all kind of we're going to plunder the Egyptians full of all kinds of treasures look at verse 21 And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
And when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Now again, notice God is not saying you're going to rob the Egyptians. He's saying, I'm giving you such favor that when they set you free, you're going to ask them as if they're just good neighbors to you, and they're going to treat you as a good neighbor and give you anything you ask for, gold and silver among them. Perhaps these women that he's mentioning feel compassion for the Hebrews suffering just like Pharaoh's daughter did when Moses was thrown in the Nile. That there was a compassion that we see an injustice done to these slaves among us. We see the suffering they've had for four centuries and there's a compassion in us so that when they go forth and they ask us, we gladly give them our possessions. Either way, Israel will leave Egypt just like God promised generations and generations and generations prior. Again, to remind you of Genesis 15, what did he say? Hundreds of years prior, the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. God keeps his word. He calls us to take his word to his people, even to take his word to the nations, to watch and be faithful to his promises. He will not only prove victorious in delivering his people, he will prove generous to his people. This is a picture of divine justice and divine generosity towards his people. He promises, I will bring justice. All injustice will eventually have justice, and I'm going to be especially gracious with my people as I set them free. God always does this. He sets you free from sin and death, and he gives you gifts along the way. He says, not only will I save you from the punishment of sin and death, but I'm going to fill you with the spirit, even spiritual gifts. I'm going to give you to the church and the church to you. You're going to have a family. You're going to have a people. This is what God is. He saves and delivers, and he gifts us along the way. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 quotes from Psalm 68, 18 and says, Christ, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then down in verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. Christ deli delivered us from slavery to sin through his death, burial, resurrection and ascension. And then when he ascended, he, along with the Father, sent forth gifts of the Spirit to the church to equip the church for work of ministry. Pastors, elders, leaders, shepherds, evangelists, teachers are gifts given to the church for the edification of the church so the church might do the mission God has sent her to do. Three more lessons on spiritual leadership. Even from looking at this, spiritual leaders should expect pushback from pagan culture. So we don't expect Pharaoh to respond positively. <laughs> to this whole interaction. And God is letting Moses know, I'm sending you to do this, and you ought not expect this to go well uh, in, in pagan culture. Spiritual leaders also can trust God's victory will eventually prevail. I don't know what these first interactions with culture is going to be. I don't know what Pharaoh's going to do. I don't know how we're going to I just know in the end, God's plan will win. God will prevail. He will be victorious, and he'll give us the gifts necessary to do the work he's called us to do. And then again, we should know spiritual leaders receive God's gifts to accomplish God's will. God has given you every gift necessary to do what God has called you to do. You lack nothing that you need to do what he's called you to do. So to be the spiritual leader God has called us to be, we must go take God's word to his people and to the nations. We tell people who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, what he will do even when he comes in the future. So we take God's word. Secondly, we go with God's power. We go with God's power. So now that God has told Moses to take his word to his people and to his enemies, Moses comes up with now another question. So again, first it was, who am I? Then it was, who are you? Now it's, well, what if they don't believe me? All right, who am I? Oh, okay, it's about you. Okay, but who are you? All right, but what if I go do what you just told me to do and tell them who you are and they still don't believe me? Again, as human beings, when God calls us to do something, it's so natural to respond with, but, 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 but what if? Like, I know you're telling me to, to share this gospel with my coworker, but what if? I know I'm supposed to point my children to Christ, but what if? Like, I know I need to have this conversation, but, 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 but are you sure it's like, but always excuses, always questions. And we see in this moment, delayed obedience is actually disobedience. <laughs> and then eventually that's going to be made clear. So usually when you're coming up, the well, if I get this question answered, then I will. No, you won't. 
Like this delayed obedience is actually disobedience. You don't want to obey. That's the problem. That's what we'll see with Moses. But for now, God graciously grants three supernatural signs. So what if they won't believe me? God continues to be gracious with Moses. He's so gracious with his leaders. Continues to be gracious. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Moses answered, But behold, they, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? He said, A staff. He said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. It became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand inside the cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they would not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Again, as we said last week, it's easy to understand Moses' question. The last time he went and tried to be Israel's deliverer, the response was, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me like you did the Egyptian? <laughs> so there's a reason for him to say, like, what if they won't believe me? I've been gone for 40 years, and again, the last interaction was not positive. They were not interested in following my leadership. And now, after being a shepherd, a despised shepherd, <laughs> he's going to go back and have this interaction. So again, you can understand Moses' question. But these three signs, they can feel pretty random to us at first reading. Like, this is just bizarre, and we're not even halfway close to the most bizarre thing. We'll get there in a minute. Wait, that one's going to be fun. But it can feel bizarre. Like, why these three signs? Why, why the staff turning to a snake? Why the leprous hand and then healed? Why the water to blood? This is not as random as it might first seem. First, as we'll see again throughout our study, the staff will be a symbol of God's powerful presence with Moses throughout the rest of the narrative. It's going to be the instrument he uses to bring forth the plagues in Israel in the midst of the battle. It's going to be the instrument he uses to part the Red Sea. It's going to be the instrument he uses when they're in the wilderness to strike the rock to give water to keep them alive. So God, through this staff, consistently throughout the rest of the narrative, is letting him know, I'm with you. I told you I'll be with you. I promised I'll be with you. I am with you. And this whole miracle is about me being with you. You can trust me. My powerful presence is there. But also notice the divine irony. A lowly shepherd will set captives free from the king of Egypt who would have had a scepter, probably with a cobra on it. We'll get there in just a second. Probably in the shape of a cobra, he's got a, a scepter that he rules with. And God is going to pick a fight with him through a despised shepherd. The Egyptians saw shepherds as the lowliest of all people. God's going to pick a fight with him and a shepherd's staff, not a, so, a scepter, is going to be used. He's going to use a lowly, humble shepherd boy to over, overthrow the king. So see the divine irony, but also, again, note the divine victory. So culturally, listen to one scholar talk to us about Pharaoh, about Egyptian culture, and about how a snake was viewed. The cobra represented in particular the national god of Lower Egypt and was the foremost symbol of Pharaoh, reflecting his claim to divine royalty, sovereignty, and power. Therefore, it constantly appears on his crown or helmet as depicted in reliefs paintings, and statues. His scepter is often a stylized cobra. Even the Egyptian gods are frequently depicted with a scepter in the form of a snake. We are safe in concluding that the transformation of the rod to a snake is a sign aimed precisely at the very symbol of Pharaoh's alleged power. So God is demonstrating, though, he thinks he's a snake that has all power and authority. What you got in your hand? Throw it on the ground. Grab it by the tail. End it. So God is demonstrating even through this moment, he's going to have victory over his enemy. Spiritual leaders, what do we take from this? Spiritual leaders are called to trust God's power even over the most evil enemies, even especially that ancient serpent, Satan himself, which is who Pharaoh is actually following. And God is demonstrating even now through this staff, no, 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 I will have victory over all of my enemies. You can trust his power as you go forth and proclaim his word. Secondly, God demonstrates his power to heal disease and sickness through the supernatural display uh, on display through the leprosy interaction. So he's saying, no, no, I can use ordinary objects like your staff to overthrow my demonic enemies. 
But also, you're going to be alarmed. You're going to be concerned about disease. You're going to be worried about your body and the the frailty of your body as you go into battle. Put your hand inside your cloak. Pull it back out. You see that leprosy? That's a death sentence for you. Put it back in your cloak. Pull it back out. Healed. Disease is no problem to me. Natural is, I can use use ordinary objects. I can conquer demons and Satan himself. I can conquer diseases. You need not worry about diseases. And then what about this third one? What about the water poured onto the ground and make it become blood? And then he's going to talk later about the firstborn son. Moses had, had been thrown into the Nile. All the firstborn babies, all the baby boys had been thrown into the Nile and killed, drowned because of Pharaoh. And God's like, no, Israel's my firstborn son. He's been killing them. I will have justice. So take water out of that blood he's been spilling and know his blood will be spilled and the firstborn of Egypt will be spilled. So these three signs are demonstrating God's like, no, no, I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm trying to give you encouragement that you can trust my promises, you can trust my word and victory is coming. I will deliver my people and none will stop me. And think about the Lord Jesus in our study in Matthew. Chapters 8 and 9. Do y'all remember the study? What does he do? Diseases heals them. Leprosy touches them. He doesn't become unclean. The leper becomes clean. Heals all diseases. What does he do with demons? Cast them out with a word into a herd of pigs. What does he do with nature? Walks on water. Calms a storm. Demonstrates that he's got power over nature, over sickness, even over demons. And in the midst of all that, why does Jesus say he's doing that? He calls his disciples to discipleship in the midst of all those miracles. Every single time these signs are showing, you can trust my word, you can follow and trust me and obey me. I am king. And so these signs are demonstrating God's word is trustworthy. And he will give the power necessary for you to trust his word. Spiritual leaders, we trust God's supernatural power to accomplish his supernatural purposes. And the ultimate sign that we trust in is that empty tomb in the Middle East. Even even John builds again the whole gospel account around the signs. But Matthew lets us know there's a sign greater than even Jonah. Just like he was three days in the belly of the fish, Matthew chapter 12, so too will the Son of Man be three days in the earth, and on the third day he's coming up out of death. And so we trust in the signs he gives because those signs are sufficient of his power that we might trust his promises. Spiritual leaders trust the sign God gives, not the ones he doesn't give. So too often, here's the temptation. Well, God, if you would just do this for me, I would believe. He's done plenty enough for you to believe. The tomb's empty. The throne's occupied. You ought to believe. <laughs> so he, he's not something now you barter with him like, nah, do this sign for me. Then you would be God telling him what to do and he'd be obeying you. That's not how this works. He gives you the necessary signs that you might believe he's trustworthy and he's God. And again, the climactic sign is that there's an empty tomb in the Middle East. So be careful we, that, that, we, that we don't get it twisted. That supernatural signs do not necessarily produce faith. It didn't in Jesus' day. <laughs> He would do all kinds of healings, do all kinds of things. And people are like, eh, still don't believe you're the son of God. It didn't in Moses' day. Why do I say that? Look what happens. Even here, Moses comes up with a fourth question. <laughs> so it's like, Moses, dang, son, you just watched that thing turn to a snake. <laughs> Leprosy? Like, come on, you still got questions. Why? Because signs don't necessarily produce faith. You must choose. No, these signs demonstrate he's trustworthy. Therefore, I trust him. Moses, God gives him now relational help. Look at verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant. But I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Again, it's like Moses, we just did this last week. We're going to do this again? (laughs) Like, so Moses again has taken his eyes off of the great I am. Who am I? It's not about you. It's who's with you. Okay, but who are you? Oh, snap, that's right. You're the great I am. And then immediately now he's like, but I got to go speak God's word to God's people and God's word even to God's enemies. But I don't don't speak well. I don't have good speech. I'm not eloquent with my words. I wasn't eloquent before this whole calling interaction. And I still ain't talking to you eloquently right now. (laughs) And listen, there's been all kind of speculation on what's going on with Moses' speech. And I don't know what the answer is. So, So potentially there was a stutter or some kind of stammer. Uh, potentially there was, yes, uh, literally some kind of speech impediment. It could be that like, he's like, man, no, when I, I was raised in Egypt, I learned how to speak. I learned the diplomatic language and how to argue and barter and talk with kings. But I've been shepherding for like 40 years. I don't know how to go back and talk like that. Like, I'm, I'm not like, I'm just a shepherd dude now. I'm not, I'm not like, you get, this don't work. 
I'm, I just don't have what it takes. So again, I'm not sure exactly what the speech problem was. But no matter what the actual problem was, the heart problem was the same. And that's what God addresses, verse 11. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord, Yahweh, the great I am? <laughs> now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. And again, in this moment, I'm like, okay, Moses, like God is speaking to you from a theophany that's a burning bush. Like you're hearing him talk to you through a fire that has no fuel and is not consuming the bush. You have a staff in your hand that just turned to a snake that you reached down and snatched up that turned back into a staff. The leprosy thing just happened. Water to blood. All of these things happen, and your response is like, yo, I don't talk good. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't. That's bad English. But like, not like this is, this is how you're going to respond. Like you've so quickly taken your eyes off of God and look back to your own abilities. And again, this is what we do. And how often are we guilty of the same? God sent his only son in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, walked on top of water, spoke and raised Lazarus from the dead, cast a herd of demons into a herd of pigs, fed 5,000 women and children with five loaves and two fish, healed a leper, died on the cross for your sins, got up from death on the third day, ascended to the Father. He, along with the Father, sent forth the Holy Spirit. He's currently praying for you. He's called you to himself. He's placed you in a church. He's given you pastors to shepherd and care and elder and help you. He gives you the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. And you're like, but what if I say something wrong? Ooh, we're just like Moses. <laughs> so quickly take our eyes off God and look at our own abilities. So easily take our eyes off of God and look at our disabilities and conclude, I can't do this. I'm scared I'll mess up. I can't lead my family in devotions. Like, what, what if I don't I know how to answer one of my kids' questions? I can't disciple somebody in the church. I, I don't know that much about the Bible. But friends, your abilities, your inabilities, even your disabilities are not the determining factor on your success. God's abilities, God's power, God's presence, that was what you must bank on. And did not our Lord command us to teach in the Great Commission? And did he not promise us that he'd be with us? Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. No matter who the Pharaoh or who the president or who the king or who the culture is, I'm with you always. Keep teaching. Keep taking my word to my people. Keep doing it, relying not on your abilities, but on my power and on my presence. Spiritual leaders are to trust in God's power and presence, not in their own abilities or inabilities. And then the real issue is exposed in Moses' fifth and final question. Again, he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> Riken captures this with great humor. He says, Moses says, here I am, send someone else. <laughs> Verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I'll be with your mouth and with his mouth, and we'll teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Now we'll talk more about Aaron later as we progress through Exodus. For right now, what I want you to see is Moses continues to give these excuses. And God continues to be gracious, though angry. And this is not like he's getting emotionally loses control anger. That would be sin. God doesn't do that. This is righteous indignation. I am God Almighty. I am that I am, and you're arguing with me. That's sinful. That's rebellious. That's problematic. And all these questions have been leading to this delayed obedience has been disobedience. And God has had enough. He's exposing it. Yet he's still gracious. He says, I'll give you Aaron, your brother. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. <laughs> but he says, I, I would give you your brother, Aaron. You, he'll be your mouthpiece. So again, spiritual leaders, we trust God's supernatural power and his gracious provisions. He gives us the gifts necessary. Sometimes he gives us things that aren't even necessary just because he's kind. In Christ even now, what power has he given us? He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. 
He's filled us with his spirit. Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So he's given us his power. He's given us his spirit to testify to our spirit that we're children of God and we can go forth and proclaim the gospel. We can disciple. We can encourage. We can parent. We can raise up. We can witness in the public square. We can do all these things because he's with us and he's given us the power of his spirit, the presence of his spirit. To be the spiritual leader God has called you to be, you must go take his word and you must go, and you must go with his power. Lastly, you must go for God's glory. So you go take his word. You take his word with his power. You take his word with his power for his glory. Now, it's popular in secular corporate leadership books to have a clearly defined why as to why you do what you do. That's the big thing nowadays. What's your why? What's your why? What's your why that keeps you going and focused on your task? For the Christian, the why is made crystal clear throughout the book of Exodus and indeed the rest of the Bible. Paul captures it by using two of the most seemingly mundane activities in 1 Corinthians 10. Whether you eat or drink, do it all. Why? <laughs> For the glory of God. <laughs> so Paul's whole point is like, no, no, everything that you do, we have our why given to us. This is not something we pick. We do everything that we do for the glory of God. Moses finally stops arguing and disobeying God, chooses to take his word with his power to his people and to Pharaoh. He obeys God even in the face of evil. So look at his obedience, verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please, let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. So Moses rightly respects his father-in-law, the head of the household. The one who's been providing for him has given him the job. And he goes to him and says, Please let me go back and, and check on my family. He then leads his wife and his children to go back into this mission with him. So he's, he's faithfully being a son-in-law in this moment, this interaction. There's a respect and an honoring for mother and father. He's faithfully being a husband, leading and serving his wife. He's taking his children into this mission God has called him to do. Notice God's sovereignty at work as well, in that Moses, those who are seeking your life, are now dead. So now God is, the exodus has begun. This is happening. God's plans in action. God will do what he needs to do to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. His sovereignty is at work. But also notice again, just as a spiritual leader, spiritual leaders must be willing to leave family behind to follow God's call. But they're to do so with respect, love, and gentle leadership of those who are going with them and those whom they are leaving. Did not Christ teach the same thing? Christ taught, honor your mother and father. And Christ also said, if you don't hate your mother, brother, father, sisters, you can't be my disciple. What's his point? He's using hyperbole to say, no, only God can be your supreme allegiance. And wherever he calls, you must go. But you go, and you go in such a way that honors those whom you leave behind. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So God instructs Moses, go, show all the signs that I've given to you. But be pre prepared for battle because I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to let you go. There's going to be a battle in this interaction. There's something else bigger than just Israel getting free going on. Moses is to give Pharaoh the ultimate threat, the death of the firstborn, as I mentioned just a while ago, to let, to let Pharaoh know, you've been messing, God is saying, you've been messing with my firstborn. And if you don't bow to me in worship and you keep this hard heart that I'm sovereign over, mysteriously sovereign over, and you are hardened, if you don't do this, I will take your firstborn. I will get glory among Egypt. Egypt will know that Yahweh is God. Now we're going to talk more about Pharaoh's heart as we go. But you do need to know for right now, Pharaoh's heart in Exodus. We read kind of three different um, details about this hard heart. One, we see the first one, God hardens his heart. Secondly, we'll read sometimes where it just says his heart was hardened and it doesn't attribute it to anyone. Thirdly, we'll read sometimes where Pharaoh hardened his heart. <laughs> so it's like triply hard. <laughs> so God is hardening. It's just being hardened and, he, and Pharaoh hardens it. And what we see in the midst of this is divine sovereignty and human responsibility and the mystery of it all, all at once together. I love what Riken says. This, 
is the paradox of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, which is not a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to be adored. You may tell you how to figure it all out, go to heaven and talk to God about it. <laughs> but for right now, understand there's something a lot bigger going on. Namely, all of these things are going to work to the glory of God. God's name will be known. Egypt will know Yahweh is the Lord. Israel will know Yahweh got us out. We did nothing to earn this. For now, notice two more realities for spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders obey God's word regardless of anticipated outcome. We're to obey his word no matter what we anticipate the outcome being. Also, spiritual leaders understand sonship. God is a perfect father. He loves Israel as his one true beloved son. And then he sent his one true beloved son. Why? To live and die to reconcile us that we might become sons and daughters. God is a perfect father. His love is on display. Spiritual leaders understand the people of God are the children of God, and we ought to lead and love and serve them as such. And yet with this fatherly love on display, we come to three of the most seemingly bizarre verses in all of Holy Scripture. And we don't even have a lot more time, which is strategic on my part. I just, oh, sorry, guys, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. <clears throat> but, but primarily what I want you to see is Moses obeyed. And then immediately what do we see? disobedience verse 24 at a lodging place on the way the lord met him and sought to put him to death excuse me what then zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched moses feet with it and said surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me excuse me what <laughs> so he let him alone it was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision so what in the world is happening right here <clears throat> i don't know y'all pray about it let's uh, let's close no <clears throat> um <laughs> A couple, a couple quick things uh, just, just to point out. What seems to me is here's, here's what's happened. Moses finally stopped arguing with God. He's finally chosen to obey. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. But in, in the midst of this journey, he still has yet to circumcise his son, Gershom, the, his first son. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant given to the patriarchs, to the fathers, to Abraham. <laughs> This was the sign that said there must be a blood sacrifice that signifies this covenant between God and his people. And God is about to take Moses and Israel into a battle with Pharaoh, and he's threatening their firstborn son. There's going to be a Passover. The play's going to end with a Passover. There's going to be blood on the mantle of the doors, and the, the, the death angel is going to pass over Israel's firstborn sons because of the blood. But he's going to put to death uh, Egypt's firstborn sons. And God, in his kindness, is related with, no, sin is sin. Sin leads to death. God only relates to people because of grace, not because they've earned it. And circumcision has been the sign that demonstrates that covenant grace relationship. And Moses has obeyed. Okay, God, I'm going to do what you say, but I still ain't circumcised my son. I'm still not going to trust in blood sacrifice, which is what this symbolizes. I'm still, not, I'm still not identifying myself with the covenant people primarily by grace. Still hasn't circumcised his boy. And would you know, again, another godly lady comes to save the day. <laughs> Moses is full of godly ladies saving the day. <laughs> I mean, uh, Exodus is. And so Zipporah, his wife, I think, recognizes what's going on. Moses deserves to die because he's refusing the covenant sign. He's refusing blood sacrifice in the, in the grace of God and his covenant people. And so she circumcises her boy and, and yeah, the foreskin and the blood. I, I, yeah, amen. Like, I'm not sure all the details culturally. <laughs> And really, none of the scholars are either. It's interesting to see what they argue and say about it. But, but, but clearly, what's demonstrated is Moses is sinful. Even when he obeys, he's still disobeying. And friends, I think there's something for us here. Spiritual leaders must depend on God's covenant of grace. No matter how good of a leader we are, no matter how faithful we try to be, there's disobedience going on sometimes we don't even realize it. Spiritual leaders depend on God's covenant of grace, and spiritual leaders depend on God's grace in and through others. Zipporah shows up, so it's God's grace in and through Zipporah that reminds Moses of God's grace and the sign of God's grace to trust in God's grace, even in this moment. As soon as we praise Moses for his obedience, we're reminded of his disobedience. As great a deliverer as he is, he is still flawed and sinful, and this is true of all spiritual leaders that God chooses to use except for one, Christ, the true and better deliverer. Moses is the deliverer God will use, but it is God's grace, God's covenant faithfulness, God's power and promises that would cause it all to happen. And when you understand this, 
And you get out and you get on your going. You get out and you go on mission. You're taking God's word. You're using his power. You're taking advantage of his patience with you as you come up with excuses and taking advantage of his forgiveness of you. And and he's still giving victories through your abilities and your disabilities. All of this is meant to say our God is gracious and glorious. It's not us that's a big deal. It's God's grace. The end goal of all of this is worship of the one true God. Read verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went, he met him in the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses and Aaron told all the words of the Lord which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he commanded him to do. So they obey. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses, did the signs in the sight of the people. They obey. And what happens? And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, they had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. What is your why? The answer for spiritual leaders, we want to lead others to glorify the God of grace. That's our why. We want God of grace to show off his grace and other people to worship God for his grace. That's the end goal of all missions in this life. All theology, all ecclesiology, all missiology is to end in doxology, worship. Everything we know and think and believe about God, about his church, about mission is meant for the end goal of glory to God. Piper says missions exist because worship doesn't. The end goal of all that we do, all of our sharing, all of our teaching, all of our discipling, all of our sending is that God would get the glory he is due. I conclude with the Apostle Paul, who I think knew this very, very well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this passage has been the, the passage that has shaped my ministry more than any other, I believe. And notice that he catches this. He's going to take God's word. He's going to do it with God's power. He's going to do it for God's glory. Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Takes the word. And I was with you in weakness. There's his disabilities. And in fear and in much trembling, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in what? In demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. Paul said, I came to you with the word of God, the word of the cross, the gospel itself. I came to you in the power of God, even despite my own disabilities. And all of it is not so you would trust in me, it's so you would trust in him and give glory and honor to God. Where is God calling you to go? What's stopping you from going? What excuse are you using today? Who is he calling you to tell about who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, what he will do? Whose power and provisions are you trusting in to accomplish what he's called you to? And what's your end goal? Grace-fueled faith, obedience, and worship or something else? Who are you fishing for? What's the next step? Go like Moses. Go like Paul. Take his word with his power for his glory. Let's close in prayer.